If you ever want to chat with strangers, nothing breaks the ice like a freshly waxed reminder of General Motors' better days. Looking good. Thank you. The car. <laughs> Without fail, a 1962 Corvette will turn heads, light smiles, and bring questions. 1962. What engine? 327. Does it have matching numbers? Okay. <laughs> Can I have it? <laughs> and if the light is long enough, they'll usually tell me some long story about the first time they fell in love. Stories that usually involve a product built by General Motors. Holy mackerel. Let's play it, man. Let's make a deal. You want to trade? Yeah. Because this is not just a car. This is a time machine to an America that no longer exists. Everybody likes my Rocket 88. Baby, we'll ride in style. The year this car was built, the White House was Camelot. It was the same year a little store called Walmart opened in Rogers, Arkansas, and the term personal computer was uttered on TV for the first time. And General Motors was the most powerful company the world had ever seen. Little GTO, you really look at mine. With a market share of 51%, literally half the nation's driveways held one of their cars. No, we're not the Jets. They employed half a million Americans. The population of Rhode Island and Nevada combined. They helped define America's vision of the future. And a lot of times they actually delivered. They built the first car on the moon. And it wasn't just cars, they built the first artificial heart. And they had soul. As a billboard outside Detroit once read, no one ever wrote a song about a Volvo. Without GM, American culture wouldn't be the same. He's looking at you, kid. Bogey took Bergman to Casablanca's airport in a Buick. And without Cadillac, it would have been walking, Miss Daisy. Oh, I just love the smell of a new car. Ford, come on ride with me in about 10 years. That's Harrison Ford ripping a 55 Chevy off the line in American Graffiti. And when Gene Hackman commandeered a 71 Pontiac in the French Connection, we got the greatest car chase ever filmed. Definitely know this car. It's 1949 Buick Roadmaster, straight eight, fireball eight. GM moved Rain Man and Batman, Ghostbusters, Knight Rider, and the A-Team. Does this thing move? Oh, yeah. And both Smokey and the Bandit. 1970 Pontiac Firebird, the car I've always wanted, and now I have it. I rule. And from Tony Soprano to rap star Ludacris. Cadillac grills, Cadillac mills. Check out the oil my Cadillac spills. Nothing brings street cred like a Cadillac Escalade. And if the new Star Trek is any indication, a 65 vet will still be cool when highway patrolmen can fly. But now, 101 years after its birth, the company that gave us all that, the company that helped build the American middle class, is flat busted. And the idea of, of GM bankrupt, those were words like nude photos of mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the horror. <laughs> Your jaw drops open. Best-selling humorist P.G. O'Rourke grew up on grease and speed. His dad was a Buick dealer. And in his new book, Driving Like Crazy, he says our feelings about the automobile were forged in the most primal way. There was no sex before the car. I presume there was reproduction, but, uh, <laughs> but there was no sex. Uh, because you couldn't take a girl out for a ride in a car because the cars hadn't been invented. You could take her out in a buggy, but then you were facing the back end of a horse. <laughs> Just not romantic, you know? Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is there room in the trunk for a <laughs> But somewhere over time, he says, our steel chariots of adventure became exhaust-belching household appliances, errand-running machines, motorized cup holders. Will GM ever be capable of inspiring this kind of passion? No. In people? No. The products no. they build? And you know, I think it's just a sociological change. I mean, one of the problems with cars is we have to spend way too much time in them. All the romance. All the romance is gone. The car's sitting there in the driveway, and we begin to blame it for all the errands we have to take it on. You know? <laughs>
For comparison, we pull my old car alongside its great-great-grandson, the 2010 Corvette. And what are your impressions when you compare the two? It's a hell of a car. It is a much better car than your old Corvette. But when it comes to gut reaction, this is what you want. It's hard to argue with nostalgia, but where there is car talk, there is disagreement. I have selected this car for you to take your driver's test. Ask TV and movie star Tim Allen to point out the best performer in his warehouse full of amazing cars, and he'll go with the new Corvette. That Corvette will eat up anything in the, in the world right now. The Porsche, Ferrari, I have a, a Carrera GT, nothing is like that. That's what GM can do. Andy says America is still capable of feeling passion for a well-built machine. Of course, he's the type of guy who puts monstrous engines in anything with wheels. This is 1,100 horsepower. Right. When you're running the engine up to get the, the horsepower rating, and I see a guy in the back going like this. He goes, I'm go, what are you doing? He goes, it, it makes my uh, <laughs> nads wiggle. <laughs> Before acting, the Michigan native worked for GM's photography department, and later, he even helped them design custom Cadillacs. Who killed General Motors? You blame labor as much as management? And there was a point when they were both making crap. But late, late 70s, early 80s, they made the same crap and expected us to buy the same crap, and it got irritating. They're bigger, more chrome, same uh, nine-inch rear end, front V8, cruddy interior, mm -hmm. and then the union blamed executives, executives blamed the union. But how did that happen? And has it stopped? And can this down and out company ever make you fall in love with their products again? These are $50 billion questions, because like it or not, you, the American taxpayer, you are now a majority owner in the new General Motors. 